around 1510, the Pope Julius II, uh, one of the successors of Sixtus IV, commissioned Michelangelo to begin painting the ceiling up above these earlier frescoes. And this included the ceiling and down to the very tops of the windows over the walls. And there's a singular design that dictates the subject matter that Michelangelo chose. Um, in the lower walls uh, over the windows are the ancestors of Christ. So we can trace his lineage moving up uh, here and into the triangular bits above as well. We see the ancestors of Christ. Above them, uh, we see prophets who foretold the coming of Christ. So Christ is alluded to as we work our way up the ceiling. But as we move our way into the center, the focus of the ceiling decoration, we don't see Christ at all. But instead we see nine scenes from the book of Genesis in the center, the very first book in the Bible. And these nine scenes are the very beginning of Genesis that tells the story of the creation of the world, including the creation of man, through the fall of man and its consequences. So the point of this is, of course, to show us the need for Christ, the need for salvation, the need for communion, even for the Pope in this place where the Pope takes communion. This is the story of original sin, uh, the downfall of human nature. Uh, now, as we look at this image, here's the scene where Adam and Eve on the left take the fruit of the tree of knowledge from Satan, the serpent, um, and for this sin are banished um, from the Garden of Eden. Uh, you'll notice how little landscape there is here, just enough to tell the story. In fact, the vast majority of the landscape is rather simplified, and man, the human figure, towers above it. This is typical for Michelangelo. When we talked about Leonardo, we talked about the fact that his figures tend to be a cog in nature's machine. But for uh, Michelangelo, man tends to dominate nature, dominate the landscape. Uh, the landscape is in fact minimized so that our entire focus becomes on the human figure. Now if we look at these nine scenes, we notice that dead center with four scenes on either side is the creation of Eve. So the creation leads up to her creation and then we start the story of the downfall. And by putting her right at the center, her appearance right at the center of the composition, what of course Michelangelo is doing is telling us that it's more or less her fault. And in these Renaissance societies uh, dominated by men, we find that women often receive the majority of the blame uh, for mankind's problems. And that's certainly the case here. Now the story begins with the very first day of creation where God separates the light from the darkness. This is a rather abstract scene, and Michelangelo paints it kind of abstractly. There's just this monstrous figure of God, uh, massively muscular, uh, pushing clouds apart to separate the darkness uh, in the upper left of the composition from the light in the lower right. <clears throat> in this particular um, detail, you can notice uh, Michelangelo's painted sculpture it looks as if these are a series of framed pictures recessed on the wall, and that illusion is created by the marble sculpture that Michelangelo uh, puts around the outside, the marble architecture. You'll also notice a series of nude figures resting somewhat precariously on this created, painted architecture. These figures are certainly intended to be the human soul, often at struggle, uh, with itself, a typical Michelangelo theme, and very similar to the captives that we saw on the Julius tomb, uh, reappearing here, symbols of the human soul. The very last scene in the series is uh, the drunkenness of Noah. Um, in order to punish mankind uh, for his sin, which was inherited from Adam and Eve, God sent a flood to purge the earth. Noah was warned. He and his family escaped the flood. 
And then afterwards he went out and got drunk and was seen naked by his children, showing us that uh, despite the flood, uh, despite uh, God purging man uh, for his transgressions, we are still sinful. And we remain forever in need of salvation, forever in need of communion. And that's the central message of the sealing, that you are, uh, you, even you, the Pope, um, are in need of salvation, in need of communion, because of our inherited sinfulness from the legacy of Adam and Eve. Now, the most famous scene of all of these is, of course, uh, the creation of Adam. And you'll notice before we look at it more closely that the pose of Adam and the pose of Noah is really similar. Uh, and this was intended on Michelangelo's part. Noah is the legacy of Adam's sin, which is there already even at the moment of creation. We're supposed to be reminded that his sin will in fact be that which brings about uh, the fall of man and the inherited sin of us all. So let's get rid of Noah and take a look more closely. Again, we see God coming in from the right here and Adam on the left. And um, you'll notice that the landscape is really minimized. It's just this bit of green earth, a little bit of blue behind it. But it's a rather simple background uh, that's intended entirely to focus us, the viewers, on the human figure, on this dialogue between God on the right and Adam on the left. Since Adam is created in God's image, you'll notice the similarity of the lower leg in each of the two. Really, Adam does take on the physicality of God, and each one of them are these superhuman muscular figures that Michelangelo loves. Uh, he's really the, the ideal body, similar to what we saw with his David. Here is Adam. His name means earth in Hebrew, and you'll notice that the earth seems to hold him back in a way, and the only part of his body that can reach out, that can break gravity, is the, is the hand that God has touched. And at the same time, the touch is not quite there. It's almost like a magnetic reaction where Adam's finger comes toward the hand of God. So this is the moment where God is activating the earth, where he has molded Adam from the clay, He's now breathing life into Adam, and the only part of Adam that seems at all truly lively is the one arm that reaches, stretches to touch the hand of God. Some people suggest that this is Eve behind the elbow of God's other hand. Elsewhere on the Sistine ceiling, Eve is a redhead, just as this woman is here, and that would make some sense since she is part of God's plan uh, for history, uh, that God knew full well what Adam and Eve would do, that they would indeed transgress. And this, of course, allows him to send his son, Christ, for our salvation. So that's altogether likely looking outward from behind God is intended to be Eve herself. Some people have argued, however, that it might also be an allusion to the Virgin Mary and God's plan for salvation. And in fact, that would uh, help to explain the little boy that you see there, uh, that God's finger is touching over the top of his shoulder. You'll notice that this boy is in a pose that's not dissimilar from Adam's, one knee up, leaning with his torso in, the, in a very, very similar way, if we think of Adam's torso in this little boy's torso here, uh, we can see a, a similarity. And you'll also notice that while one finger touches Adam, or nearly touches Adam, the other finger seems to point at the little boy's Adam's apple. We've seen before Christ's Adam's apple indicated in works of art as a way of uh, showing us that he has come to save us from the curse of Adam that he, like Adam, sent by God to mankind, is now the new Adam who will bring about our salvation, whereas the old Adam brought about our downfall. And Michelangelo seems to be showing us exactly that here in this most famous scene from the Sistine ceiling. 